Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You are watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And today's message, and I've touched on the two witnesses and many times in the past, but it seems like every time I've touched on it, it's when the Lord reveals a particular issue to me about it. And of course, He's done so once again. Um, but it just gives you bits and pieces here and there. So we actually have a segment on our YouTube channel called The Two Witnesses, where you can see the different messages that I've uh, spoken on this subject to help people better understand who they are, what their identity is. And today, I, I spent quite a bit of time for the last couple of days putting together all the biblical, scriptural facts for who the two witnesses are, and also um, to deal with the issue of the idea of who they are not. Um, now, I didn't get so much into the part about where some people think, well, it's John or uh, it could be the Old and New Testament, things like that, uh, Christians in Israel. But there's a couple little places that will clear that up for you as well. But I wanted to start with you on the very main scripture that is used to support the idea that it's Enoch and Elijah. And keeping in mind the reason people choose Enoch and Elijah is because neither man ever tasted death. Enoch, he never died. He was, was walked and was with God and just disappeared off the earth. Same thing with Elijah. He's taken up in a chariot wind of fire, never sees death. Moses, on the other hand, he dies, but oddly enough, his body doesn't see corruption. You see this with the argument of Satan with uh, Michael the archangel, which we'll touch on that a little later. So, so let's look at the scripture, though, that people are using. It's found in the book of Hebrews. Now, many people believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, but there is some historical evidence that suggests that Paul is not the actual author of it. But nonetheless, it is definitely a canon of the Bible. It was actually believed to be written by a sister, one of the apostles that was a sister. Um, anyhow, regardless of that debate, we won't go into that. Let's just read the verse that is singled out every time and used in the, de the defense that Enoch must be one of the two witnesses. It says here, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And of course, the Greek word, it can be translated in other ways as well, not just as far as an appointment or an absolute, but, um, but it, is, it says appointed. And many times I would hear people quote this. And I went back as I was preparing all of this, and I decided to read what all was written here in the book of Hebrews. So I backed up, and of course, I want to pick up with you on verse 24 of chapter 9 and follow the theme of what's actually being said. And then it'll make more sense why this is written. It says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, you got to keep in mind, what is the figure of the things that are true? He's talking about the temple, talking about the sacrifices that were to be offered up on our behalf. Okay, this is what it's speaking of here. But he's in the presence of God for us, making intercession upon our confession or our profession of what we believe and asking God's forgiveness. He makes that intercession. But it says, nor yet that he should offer himself often. In other words, is he going to die more than once? That's the important part of this right here, verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. As the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. That's Yom Kippur. The scripture for the, um, the, the scapegoat, which is the one that the sins are confessed upon him, and, a, and he's taken out by a strong man into the wilderness and released, which Christ represented the scapegoat. He bore the sins of Israel far away. And then the other goat, the sacrificial goat, that was to be killed. And as I've said to you in time past, Christ is both sacrificial goat and scapegoat, and I believe that this actually comes from the type and the story of Joseph. Why? Because Joseph, as we know, his brethren throw him in a pit. He's supposed to be dead. And they take him forcibly by their hands and put him in the pit. And then they bring him out and they sell him off. He's sold 
and he goes down to Egypt and is sold once again. They sell him like Christ was sold for, I believe what it was, 28 pieces of silver or 20 pieces of silver, something like that, just by memory. I forgive me for not having that exactly right, but he's sold out by his brethren. What is he? He is now the scapegoat. They laid their hands upon him much as we were to lay our hands upon Christ or as, or as the high priest did, he laid his hands upon the scapegoat and confessed the sins of Israel on the scapegoat. And we find the same situation. They take, after he's sold out, he bears in his body the sins of his brethren far from the eyes of their father. And you know, there's no place that we see scripturally now, not to say they didn't confess their sins to their father later, but we don't see a biblical evidence that they ever, it was ever revealed to their father that they did this. But on the other hand, though, what happens? We also see that they take a, a, one of the kids of the goat and they kill it and pour the blood upon his coat of long sleeves. In Hebrew, it says coat of long sleeves. We don't have it as coat of many colors. I'm not quite sure where that comes from, but that's what they did. They put the blood upon his coat and they take that to his father and say, discern, is this your son's coat or no? That was the sacrificial lamb that they laid their hands upon that God accepted as a sacrifice for their sins, lest he would have killed them. No different than Israel 2,000 years ago when they placed their hands on Christ Jesus and condemned him to death, they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And what they meant in a derogatory sense, God applied his blood on their lives, else we would not have the tribes we have today. We would be missing 10 of the tribes. Interesting, isn't it? Which, that's kind of an interesting thing in itself because the house of Israel was 10 tribes that went into exile. But we do have three tribes back in Israel today. The house of Judah, which makes up Levi, Judah, and Benjamin. The very ones that condemned him in the first place. As we know, Zechariah also speaks about how that it would be the house of Judah to be gathered first in order to, to, to repent of their sins. Don't want to get into that too much. That's a little for, off, off course here. Has a lot to do with the two witnesses, though, I would say there. But... As we go on to read here, it says here, verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. In other words, if there wasn't a type of the sacrifices to be offered, Christ would have had to come often and died for the people. All right? Hath he, uh, excuse me, since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, or anthropos, mankind, once to die, but after this, the judgment. Verse 27 that is used for Enoch to justify Enoch as one of the two witnesses has nothing to do with Enoch nor Elijah. This is dealing with only the case of Christ, that he was appointed only once to die for the sins of the people. Why then have we spent... All these people have been spending all their time misinterpreting the word of God to you. And as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Christ was only meant to die once. And whether we accept him or refuse him will bring judgment afterwards. And if, they, if this is to be taken literally like they're supposing it, taking it out of the context of the sentence or the, or the, or the, or the whole paragraph or chapter there, then must we say then, then why did Lazarus die twice? Why did the little girl that Jesus prayed for, why did she die a second time? I, I'm a personal witness myself. My mother had been dead for about 15, 20 minutes when they brought the message to me. And then I prayed earnestly before the Lord and God raised her up. Two years later, she died again. Sister Lisa, dear friend of ours, died three times. She's got to do a fourth death. See, it doesn't line up with the Word of God. So the idea that it's appointed once unto man to die, and Enoch and Elijah must come back and die, is totally out of the context 
of what was written here. Verse 28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. It specifically is a prophetic word about Christ and him alone. So we satisfy and we settle the argument that it has to be Enoch because he has to die. No, totally incorrect with the scripture. Now we can see why. See, Enoch has always been a problem for people, even the people that believe that he has to come back and die. It was always an issue. Why? Because people know that when you look at the rest of the scripture, it doesn't seem to line up doesn't line up anywhere because when it looks at the witnesses of Revelation 11 it's clearly not it's not the nature of the two that are there in many other scriptures and that's what we're going to go into now let's take a look at some other scriptures here I want to take you to Matthew chapter 17 verse 3 now we're going to look a lot more at Matthew but this is just kind of setting the stage for us and behold there appeared unto to them they go up there, and it says, and, and, and there appeared unto them, um, Peter, I believe, was one of those with them, unto them Moses and Elias, which is the Greek word for Elijah, Moses and Elijah talking with him. Moses and Elijah appeared unto these men as they were witness of him coming, and they appeared with Jesus, Yeshua, there on Mount Transfiguration. Been there before, beautiful place. And, and what's, what's ironic, let me tell you something a little bit about Mount Transfiguration. In 2004, the first time when I went to Israel, and I was actually bar mitzvahed at the Wailing Wall in Israel myself as well, as uh, back years ago. But when I went to Israel in 2004, I was coming across the, the, the uh, Jehoshaphat Valley. I had no idea, no idea where... Moses and Elijah appeared to Yeshua. Many, many, I mean, hundreds of mountains in Israel. Even though it's a small country, still many, many mountains there. I say hundreds, maybe a hundred. I don't, I don't know the exact number. And I'm in a little group, maybe six of us, and I look across that valley. There was one mountain that my eyes fell upon, and when they did, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, this is where Moses and Elijah appeared with Yeshua. And I'm like, that is weird. Then I wanted to go there. Well, a few minutes later, then the, the, the tourist guide that we had said the exact same thing. He said, the mountain in front of you. Of course, he said, it is believed that this is where Moses and Elijah came down to Yeshua. He said, that's just tradition, though. But the Lord had actually spoke to me and told me before that, that that was the place. So I do find it very interesting. Who knows? Anyway, so let me take you now to Zechariah chapter 4. In light of the fact that Moses and Elijah are talking with Yeshua and appear to, the, to the, uh, the, 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 the apostles that went up with him, it says here, chapter 4, verse 12, And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes emptied the golden oil out of themselves? Because there was a, uh, there was a, uh, uh, a lampstand with the seven... Um, candlesticks on it, which is a menorah, and there was two olive trees on either side. So they're asking the question, you know, this is what uh, Zechariah wants to know, Who, what are these two olive trees? And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Now watch verse 14 very carefully. Then, he, then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. It's the two witnesses. And we know this because of Revelation 11 says they are the two olive branches or the two olive trees, right? But notice what he says at the end, the conclusion of verse 14, that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Who's the Lord of the whole earth? Yeshua is. And these two anointed ones are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. And then on Mount Transfiguration, we get a preview of the two witnesses as Moses and Elijah are standing on either side of Yeshua, standing by Yeshua, the Lord of the whole earth. And here they are standing by him. And Zechariah, the angel tells Zechariah how to be able to identify them. Amazing. God's word is perfect. Not Enoch. Has nothing to do with Enoch. Appointed man wants to die. That is a prophecy of Yeshua. 
So it says here, Revelation uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 2, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's three and a half years. Now, if you, um, that one's easy to note. The two witnesses are a little different. It says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's how we know Zechariah's prophecy is the, the, the two anointed ones that are standing, bef standing bef uh, beside the Lord of the earth. So, again, this is declaring who they are. Zechariah has already showed us who they are, the anointed ones, the witnesses. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. But this is beginning to show a nature of the two witnesses, the nature so that we can identify who they are. Now, if you think about it, who did, who actually brought fire down? Because I don't think that this is a literal fire. They just open their mouth and flame comes out like a dragon or something. No, I don't think it's that at all, but it's what they say. It's what they speak. And this is very much the nature of Elijah. Notice what it says in second Kings chapter one, verse 10. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, as they come up, they're wanting him to come down before the king. He's not willing to go, uh, especially with the way they're coming. And he says, if I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. This happens, I believe, twice. And on the third time, the third captain that comes up bows himself to the earth and comes reverently before the prophet of God. But that's how the fire that proceeds from the mouth, it's what they speak. In this case here, it is the nature of Elijah to bring those types of judgments. Now let's read on. Uh, finishing verse uh, 5, And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Rough way to deal with these two guys. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Again, that's another characteristic of Elijah. It says in 1 Kings 17, 1, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. They have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now we're getting into Moses' ministry. If you'll notice, though, it's two different things that they mention about both to show you as a witness, again, too, as a witness of who they are. Now, with Moses, we have to look at Exodus chapter 7, verse 19. It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, and their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water. And they may become blood, and that, that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So, Moses is the one that turns the water to blood. Again, Moses and the plagues, we have to look at that. Exodus 9, verse 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, and thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. So Moses is one that certainly brings plagues, as God has shown that he would do there. So turning the water to blood, bringing about the plagues, these are things that Moses has done in his own life. But it's, it's interesting that God never actually calls them by name. And I think there's a reason for that. Is one person wrote me, I believe it was a sister, saying to me, Brother Steve, I kind of wonder if it's not actually people anointed with that spirit. Well, we're going to get into that in just a moment, but that's probably more accurate to say. Not that it has to be literally Moses and Elijah returning, but it is the spirit that was upon them, the Holy Spirit, in the same nature, in the same way that they were, returns back in these end times. And there's many scriptures to support just that very thing. Let's read on. Revelation eleven seven, 7. 
And when they shall finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now this is why they are called witnesses. Because why? God cannot bring judgment. Upon this world without a minimum of two witnesses especially in the case of whoredom in the case of adultery because you have to remember the church is saying that they are the true bride of Christ the Catholic Church is saying clearly that they are the world's true church and that every other denominational believer must come back to the mother Rome as it speaks about in Revelation she was a great whore and had many daughters that were harlots and the harlots are returning to their mother. Interesting that the churches are called harlots as well. What have they done? They've always prostituted. You know, the, the church is so quick to condemn Israel for her sins, which Israel had enough sins as well and committed whoredom just like the church has. But clearly God has shown that the church is doing the exact same thing. Now, I'm not speaking about the individuals, just like as far as the Catholic church. No doubt, there are many Catholic people in the Catholic church that God wants to save, that He wants them to come out. In fact, when He brings this judgment upon them, He's trying to get them to repent. This is how merciful God is. He wants them to repent. But they don't. And that's the sad part. Now, so He goes on and He says their, uh, their, their bodies lay there three days and a half. So what are they doing? They're witnessing. They come, they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now the gospel is setting the captives free, just as Yeshua did, just as Paul did, the apostles did. But especially in the case of Yeshua and Paul, they set the captives free. They made an equal basis there. Do you know that when Rome, this was something we learned from the tourist guide that we had there when we were at the amphitheater. And, and, and keep in mind, when we, when we went to Rome, this is not a vacation for us. I have been threatened many times already that my life would be taken from me for speaking against the Catholic Church. I've been threatened by the U.S. government for saying things against the Catholic Church. I've also been threatened by the United Nations as well for speaking against the Catholic Church. So for me to go to Rome is at a risk to my own life. But I went there for several reasons. One, they needed to be paid back for what they did to the Jewish people at the tomb of David for coming and taking Mount Zion from Israel and holding their, their, uh, their communion, their, 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 uh, their sacrilegious way of doing a communion. It's not, even a, it's not even a real communion, but what they do is they come there and they do their sun god worship at the tomb of David. And so I wanted to call their hand out before God so that the world will see. She can't be satisfied with having her little place in Rome where God prophesied in Obadiah that Esau's descendants would be, but has to come and take Israel as well. So we come on their own grounds to let them know that they are doing wrong. And it gives them the opportunity to repent as well. And I can only trust that many Catholics will come out as a result. So we go on. It does say, I believe in Revelation, what is it, 8-4 or 9-4, something like that. Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. I'm extremely concerned for those that are in there, including the Jewish people as well. God says to you, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins or her plagues, which is clearly showing that the judgments of God will come down by the two witnesses. Verse 10, that they dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them that make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. So their ministry is going to be very severe. They don't suffer their bodies to be put in graves. They have witnessed. Now what are they doing? And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. They have witnessed the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. They bring forth the gospel in its purity. They restore setting the captives free. 
You know, I, I forgot to finish to you what I was going to tell you what happened to the tourist guide that said to us there at the amphitheater in Rome. He said the reason why the Romans put to death the Christians is because they brought in a way of belief that did not work in Roman society. He said, you have to understand, we had servants, and it was able, it made us able to be able to have six months of the year off. He said, and you're actually getting the exact same thing, and he breaks it down in a comical little way. He puts it in there. You know, you got two days a week off. You have all the holidays off in the year. You have all your sick leave. And he said the same today. He says, you are living in a Roman empire today under the same standards. And he said, and Christianity brought equality, saying that everyone was equal. They were all sons and daughters of God. And he said the Romans would not accept that. Of course, until Constantine seen that he couldn't overcome the Christians, so he just united church and state and then put all the people back in bondage again. Put the women in bondage and allowed slavery. All of that was all set back in order. The two witnesses will also preach equality. So they come in their witness to what the gospel was that was preached by Yeshua, by Paul, by the apostles, both men and women apostles that were speaking. So they rise up after three and a half days, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither, verse 12. And they ascended up into the heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain men of seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to, God, to the God of heaven. All right, now, this sets us to stage to see who the two witnesses are by their nature. Let's look a little deeper into this, though. Let's take and let me take you to 1 Kings chapter 19. And this here, we're going to examine how God actually does this. Is it the literal Moses and Elijah that would come, or is it two individuals that are just anointed in the same manner? Well, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 16, it said, Jehu the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And this is God speaking to Elijah. And then he says, And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abamelocha, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. God knows he's going to replace Elijah. So he has him to anoint him to be his replacement. If we go down to verse 18, it says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Isn't that interesting? Every mouth that hasn't kissed him. Believe me, there's been a lot of people kissing the Pope. So he departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, that I may follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? Isn't it interesting that he's plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen? And of course, each yoke has two oxen under there, showing the 12 tribes of Israel, both in the past as well as the 12 tribes that John recognizes in Revelation, different tribal order, Dan and Ephraim missing, but of course replaced by Levi and Joseph. Joseph replacing Ephraim, showing that Ephraim's descendants would not be missing, only his name. As God says, my, in my bowels, I still remember him still, speaking of Ephraim, because of his love for him. Even though he got off into idolatry, God, for some reason, there was something about Ephraim that he really loved. And by the way, that's where Joshua comes from, from the tribe of Ephraim. So anyway, we see clearly that Elijah, uh, or Elisha, replaces Elisha, but in a spiritual sense. We find that, though, in 2 Kings, when this actually happens, when Elijah goes up in the... Uh, uh, but before he goes up, the question is asked in chapter 2, verse 8, And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away. Before I be taken away from thee, or from you. And Elisha said, I pray you, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Interesting. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing, but nevertheless, 
If you see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto you. But if not, it shall not be so. And we know the story. He sees him go up, and he drops his mantle, and he takes it back with him. Now, here's what gets interesting. Notice this here. In verse 14, as we go a little further down, it says, And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and he smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? I actually said the God's divine name, Hashem. And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. I used to always say kind of a little jokingly there, they didn't like boat rides. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. This is one of the first cases where, well, actually, it's the second case where we see this. Because in the case of Moses, which we're going to talk about, God does the same with Moses with Joshua. Let's read on. Now, we've already talked about how that in Matthew, let me, and I'm going to pick that, let me pick that back up again. Matthew 17, 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Eli Elias, or Elijah, talking with him. And of course, Zechariah asks, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side? And I answered again to him and said, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, These are the, you know, uh, the, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Zechariah says, Then said, he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. See, as we mentioned before. Now, the reason I'm bringing this out is because I want to read to you a little bit more from Matthew's gospel there about Yeshua. So anyway, he says in verse 4 in chapter 17 of Matthew, Then Peter said uh, unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, because Peter was one of the witnesses of Moses and Elijah appearing. Uh, if thou wilt, let us make th here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. I kind of wonder if that's not where the Vatican gets their idea or their inspiration about building churches over every historical site there is. Because Peter thought that was, should be what they should do. Of course, they claim Peter to be there to hand the keys over to them. But that's not what Yeshua was looking at. But the point is, though, in Zechariah, the anointed ones are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. That's what we find in Matthew, that Moses and Elijah appear beside Yeshua. They're standing, the two anointed ones, Moses and Elijah, are standing there beside the Lord of the whole earth. And that was Yeshua. Now, verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. All right, now let's drop down to verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? So this was something that was believed. It's still believed among the Jews today that Elijah is going to actually return. Now I have to bring these things out here because you have to understand words that are said that people are constantly misunderstanding about the two witnesses. Notice verse 10, how Jesus answers this. And his disciples, excuse me, verse 10 is where they ask the question, why is Elias must first come? Verse 11, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, or Elijah, that's Greek for Elijah, truly shall first come and restore all things. Now, keep in mind, Matthew 17, 11, John the Baptist is already dead. And Jesus is now saying that Elijah truly shall first come, and he's going to restore all things. And the word shall there in Greek is a future. He puts it in the future. And, they're going to, and Elijah is going to restore all things. John the Baptist did not restore all things. And John the Baptist was already dead. But then notice what he says. In verse 12, But I say unto you, that Elias, or Elijah, is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. 
This is where people get it confused. They think that they're both being applied to John the Baptist. Well, why would Jesus put one in the future and then one in the past? You have to remember because Yeshua, the Messiah, comes twice. Once he come in order to die for our sins. The second time he comes to reveal himself to Israel. The same you find in Isaiah 61. When he read the scroll of Isaiah, he reads the first, the acceptable year, verse 1 and half of verse 2, but the second half of verse 2 he doesn't read. It was to bring judgment when he comes the second time, and also it opens the blinded eyes of Israel. That's what Isaiah 61 concludes. The entire chapter is the redemption of Israel. You see? So therefore... He puts it in the future because Elias or Elijah, he's going to come. He's letting you know he's going to come and he's going to restore everything. Because why? Christ knew that everything was going to be completely messed up and misconstrued. He knew that the church was going to completely ruin and destroy everything that he had come to do. And they've done a very good job at it. So he has to send two witnesses in the end. Because he can't get two Baptists or two Methodists, two Pentecostals, two Catholics or anything, or not even two popes, the two false witnesses that we have now, Benedict and Pope Francis, they're not going to get it right. But they're much like Janes and Jambers that withstood Moses, no doubt. Okay, so anyhow, so he says, he come to him already. Now he's speaking of John the Baptist, and they realize this. They realized then that he was speaking of John. So he shows two different times there. Now watch what he does here. Now, to prove that John was not the Elijah of verse 11, where he puts it in the future, all we have to do is take a look at what Jesus does and how Jesus applied Malachi's prophecy to John. Or actually, um, maybe the way Luke applied it. Let's do it. Let me say it like that. How Luke applied the prophecy that was done like that. Because they're, they're with him. They know. Let's look at Malachi chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Remember ye the law, the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded to him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and the judgments. So interesting. Isn't it interesting how he brings up Moses? He's going to talk about Elijah, but he brings up Moses first. I think that's kind of ironic in itself. Then he says in verse 5, Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, was the great and dreadful day of the Lord during John's time? Certainly not. But according to Luke, Part of verse 6 is actually attributed to John. Let's look at it. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Now Luke clearly identifies this as John. In Luke chapter 1 verse 17 he says, He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Hmm. Interesting. What fathers? Our fathers, as always recorded in the Bible, according to the Jewish people, is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who later had his name changed, changed to Israel. These are our fathers, our forefathers of the Jewish people. What was the heart of our fathers? To see the coming of the Messiah. This was their heart. And he turns the heart of the fathers to the children. In other words, he introduces the Messiah, the heart of our fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that longed to see him. How do we know this? Because Yeshua actually says in one place, when they ask him, they say, you're a man not over 50 years old, and you say you've seen Abraham. Because why? Yeshua said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad When did he see it? When the three strangers come walking up that day. Abraham's heart's desire was to see him. And he got to see him. And he was glad. The heart of the fathers was to see the Messiah. Yeshua bore record of that. And he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he was glad and they were making fun of him because he knew the secrets of the heart and he said Abraham did not do this 
In other words, Abraham did not make fun of him because he had a gift of discernment and knew the intents and secrets of the heart. Hmm. Think about that. Then it says, In the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, Luke does not apply the heart of the children to their fathers. Now, he does talk before that about many would be, would be one to the Lord. But he doesn't talk about the children's to their father, the heart of the children to their fathers. What is the heart of the children? That's when the children of Israel will recognize that the Messiah was indeed Yeshua. See, the first time around, he brings, he introduces the Messiah. That's the spirit of Elijah introduces the Messiah. The second time around, though, it's not John, but it's still Elijah. Yeshua said that Elias or Elijah shall first come and restore all things in the future. But John had already come. John tried to get him to recognize the heart of the fathers. He turned to the children. In other words, he, he introduced the Messiah. Jesus said that Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad that he saw it. And I'm just paraphrasing that, but he was glad that he saw it. You see? Oh my gosh, how precious this is. But the children of Israel were not ready. It's when Elijah comes again that they will be ready because this time he turns the heart of the children. See, then it's, it's the opposite way around. The first time it was the heart of the fathers to the children. Now it's going to be the heart of the children to their fathers. Let's, he smites the earth with a curse. It curses those plagues. So Israel will have their eyes open, and that's when Elijah will be fulfilled according to the prophecy that Jesus says that truly Elias shall first come and restore all things. The restoration of all things is when Israel has finally recognized that Yeshua is the Messiah. And they do that by Elijah. Mm. Very interesting. Now, we, we've set the stage for Elijah, clearly. But notice, though, in every case, in the case of when Elisha took the spirit of Elijah, which is really the Holy Spirit. It's not technically Elijah's spirit coming inside. It's not reincarnation or nothing like that. It's the Holy Spirit that was upon Elijah that made him do the things that he did. And Elisha received a double portion, did twice as many miracles recorded in the Bible that, that Elijah did. And then when John comes, John doesn't come with the miracles, but he comes in the power of Elijah. He comes in there to do what? To introduce the Messiah. But it's under the spirit of Elijah. His nature was like Elijah. All right? And then Yeshua promised that it's going to come again. Why would God break the continuity of his own word? Would he literally bring Elijah? He doesn't have to bring him back. Elijah doesn't have to die. I'll prove to you another scripture to that will prove to you that he doesn't have to die. As I've already sh started off, so we proved this clearly for you that you saw that Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, appointed unto men once to die, has nothing to do with, with us, nor does it have anything to do with Enoch and Elijah. That was a scripture clearly identified to Yeshua that he would only have to come and die once. Clearly, no other way around that. So to misinterpret the scripture just because someone wants to keep it to their theology or whatever, or because they find something over here, or because it's nonsense. Stay with the word. Keep it with the word of God. Now, we see that it's the spirit of Elijah that comes. So somewhere God's going to anoint someone with that spirit of Elijah. Just as we don't have literal James and Jambres coming back, but the same spirit that was on James and Jambres is actually going to be upon two false witnesses. And I, I could be wrong, but I believe that Pope Benedict and Pope Francis may very well be those two false witnesses. Tell me they haven't been trained in all the great knowledge of Egypt. Certainly they have. According to their own books that they have, they study the Egyptian hieroglyphics, they, they have studied deeply into the, in, into the uh, uh, magical things. They have all the gods, the 12 gods of Zeus in them, and Hercules is all there in 
the Vatican there. They have them all lined up. They have the Egyptian gods. They have the Sphinx, uh, a replica of the Sphinx in there. What, is, what, are, what, are, what are pagan things doing? And if it's supposed to be a true church, what do we have all these pagan relics in there for? No wonder why God is sick of it. No wonder why God has the two witnesses in Israel to destroy. He tells Moses, destroy all of that. Now, I want to share with you some prophecies about Moses that have never been fulfilled. Now, we already know, according to Revelation 11, that we can see the nature of Moses there by turning the water to blood and also bringing about the plagues, exactly what he did. But is there a scripture like if Jesus spoke about Elijah, Elijah's going to come in the future and restore all things, is there other scriptures where God has said that Moses would return? Let's look at that. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Moses says unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? Mashimo in Hebrew. What shall I say unto them? You know they never asked, we have no biblical record where they ever asked Moses what was the name of God. Now he does declare it to them later, and we know this because another proof that they never asked him what his name was is in a very interesting passage. Let me share that with you as well. In Exodus chapter 6, and you've got to keep in mind, in Exodus chapter 6, when this event takes place, Moses has already come down. He's already introduced himself to the elders of Israel. And he's, remember, he says to God, they will ask me, what is your name? Well, God is not giving him his name at that point. He just says, which means I am, or I will prove that which I am. So in chapter 6, he's already met with Pharaoh the first time. Now they're having to make a bunch of bricks, and they're really upset. And the Lord says here, uh, And the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for by a strong hand shall he let them go, and by a strong hand shall he drive them out of, uh, out of his land. And we'll just say Yahweh for the sake of those that we don't know his name, but just say, Ani Yahweh. Okay, And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Then he says, And the ira el Abraham, el Yitzhak, ve el Yaakov, ve el Shaddai. I appeared unto Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. All right? Now notice what he says here. Ushmi, Yahweh, See, but my, my name, Yahweh, lo no deetati lechem. I was not known to them. So here, God is actually revealing his divine name to Moses, and not because they've asked him. We don't have a record of that. But because God chose to do so at that particular time. Now, so therefore, when Moses asked this question, they will say to me, they will ask me, what is his name? This has never been fulfilled. But we are living in a time now where for nearly 2,000 years the divine name of God has not been pronounced. And basically that, that has been lost to know how to say it. Now I know I've got friends, I know Nehemiah Gordon and Nehemiah, uh, we're not close friends, we're just acquaintances, we met via the internet and uh, I know he believes it, he has gotten the revelation of that name. Uh, through, through, through his own research. But I hold fast to the word of God that says it will be revealed when Israel is compassed about with armies. There's two different scriptures on that. And uh, let's, let's just let's take the time to look at it. I, was, I didn't have it in my notes, but let's take the time. You need to know those as well. In Zephaniah chapter 3, let, let's look at this. Let me back up just a little bit here. Uh, verse three, chapter 3, verse 6, I have cut off the nations, their towers are desolate. Uh, 
I made their streets waste that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. I said, surely thou will fear me. Thou will receive instruction so their dwelling should not be cut off. However, I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. Therefore, now watch what God says here. Verse 8 and verse 9, very critical. Therefore, wait you upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. Even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. God says, wait on him. His determination is to gather the nations. See, I may assemble the kingdoms. Nations and kingdoms. That's, that's including the Arab kingdoms. That's including the nations like the United States, Russia, Canada, all these nations here. He's going to bring them down. Then he says in verse 9, uh, notice uh, before we go to verse 9, all my fear is saying, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Mm. Could that be the two witnesses that are bringing about his plagues like he did in, 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 in Egypt? Perhaps. I, I can't say for sure exactly when God's jealousy comes, but I have a feeling that's when it is. Then notice verse 9. For then I will turn to the people a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord. This name Yahweh that we so desperately want to know how to pronounce it. It's restored then to serve him with one consent to be restored at the time that he brings the nations down to Israel and he's ready to enter into judgment, which that's exactly what the two witnesses bring as judgment. So Moses, when the question is asked, when he asks God, they will say, what is his name? What do I tell them? All right? And God clearly shows him. Clearly shows him. Or, or excuse me, it's, it's, it's a scripture that clearly was not fulfilled. It's to be fulfilled. Now this is one prophecy of Moses that not, has not been fulfilled. And that might be one people might say, oh, that's not really a big deal. Let's look at some of the other ones. Oh, there's quite a few. And I'm sure there's many more. The Lord just has not revealed them all to me as of yet. But he's, over time, he's revealed many of them. That's why you've always got bits and pieces. I felt that it's important to bring all this out to you. Exodus 4, verse 7. And he said, put thine hand. This is God speaking to Moses again. Put thy hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand in his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Now, this is where God tells him, he's telling him to take his staff, he throws it on the ground, turns to a serpent, his hand turns to what appears to be leprosy, and he's healed again. The serpent turns back to a, a, a staff. And that's interesting in itself. If you know anything about the Egyptians and what they did with serpents and, and things like that, it's very interesting uh, about some of the things that I've been discovering because the Catholic Church is really big into learning these things uh, in, in their Jesuit orders there. I've been learning what they believe about these things. I have to go into that another time. I, I don't have time to go into that right now. But anyway, it says, and it shall come to pass. Now watch what he says in verse 8. Exodus chapter 4, verse 8. It shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign. Wait a minute. If you look in all of... Exodus 4, he hadn't spoke of a voice as of yet. But he speaks of the physical signs. And he's saying to him, if they will not hearken, if they will not believe you, let me say it in plain English, and it shall come to pass, if they will not believe you, neither listen or hearken to your voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Everywhere we see in Scripture, the children of Israel never believed Moses. Now, I know many Jewish people would argue and differ with me on that, but the reality of it was, we know this because why? Even when the promised land is coming, only Joshua and Caleb, out of all the originals that came out of Egypt, they all died except Joshua and Caleb. So clearly they did not believe Moses. So he says to them, if they will not, if they do not believe you, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Now God is giving 
the word voice there. Why? Because God knows that it's going to be the spirit that is on in Moses which will fall in this latter day. And so therefore, he calls it a voice. And the voice has nothing to do with the two physical signs, that, the two physical miracles that God just showed Moses. Let's read on down a little bit more. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass that they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, the two signs, see, or unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Hmm. Do you know that this signs was to the children of Israel? Take water out of the river and it shall become blood upon the dry ground. That voice of the latter sign has not been fulfilled. Now, let's look at Exodus 15, 1, moving along here. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, See, I will sing unto the Lord. Even Rashi, the great Torah commentator of the, of the, of the, of the Midrash, he writes in there, Undoubtedly, Moses comes back, and it must be in the Messianic age. Because why? He notices that this is a song sung in the future, and notice what the song says. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. There were 600 horses and riders that pursued after the children of Israel, and they were all hurled into the sea and killed. Why is Moses singing in a future tense about a song of getting victory over one horse and one rider? That is the Antichrist who rides those four horses of Revelation. The same rider, but he only rides one horse at a time. And when he rides that last horse, that mixed colored horse, Moses will triumph gloriously over him. That triumph is when his own body is laid as a witness before the world, as right with Elijah, and they raise up. It's also when God destroys Rome. Because the Bible says the whole earth rejoices. When the whole earth rejoices, God says he will destroy Adam. The only time in Scripture history that we see that the whole earth rejoices is the death of the two witnesses in Revelation. That's the triumph. Also, we're coming down to the end of this now. Exodus chapter 34, verse 10. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do wonders. And King James it puts it marvels, but it's actually wonders from Hebrew. Such as has not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. He doesn't mention the children of Israel here. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Even the rabbinical scholars have wondered, should this have been translated differently? They said, because Moses never did anything greater. This, this is in Exodus 34. This is long after the Egyptian, case, the, the, the Egyptian plagues, long after the parting of the Red Sea. God says to him here, observe thou, uh, um, observe thou that, that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest. God already said that Moses wasn't going in. Because he smote the rock when God told him to speak to the rock. And how God is saying that, be careful, don't make any covenants. See, God knew in Daniel, that Daniel 11, that, 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 or in Daniel chapter 9, excuse me, Daniel chapter 9, that Israel is going to make a covenant with that Antichrist system, with Rome. Because it says in Daniel 9, 25, 26, in those areas there, that, they, there, that there is a prince that shall come, and he would be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which was Rome. 
They would make a covenant with him, but in the midst of the week, in the midst of that seven years that is allotted to Israel, according to Daniel's 70th week there, they break that covenant. And that's exactly what happens. They break the covenant. And God warns Moses not to be a part of that. Not only that, but you have to remember, Moses comes along with Elijah, and they come with judgment. Evils are coming upon the earth. Anytime a nation is being defeated, especially by two guys, sure they're going to try to make a covenant with them. Anything to stop what's going on. But God warns him, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest. That was the promised land. That was Israel. And God said that he wouldn't let him go there. He let him see it, but he wouldn't let him go there. Again, it's another proof or could be a proof, could be a suggestion there, that it's a man anointed with his spirit. The spirit, the Holy Spirit that was upon him that caused him to do the things that he did. Keeping it in line that God would not let him go in at that time. Then he says on, he said, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. You see, it'd be a trap. It'd only be a trap. It wouldn't stop the work, but it'd just be a trap. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. There's too many altars to Baal in Israel as it is. They've got to come down. But thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Now you might, you know, people could speculate. I mean, all kinds of people, especially you put this kind of video out, they might think, oh my gosh, what does that mean? He's going to go over there and blow these things up? No. All God has to do with one of them is to speak, let one of the plagues come, let, let an earthquake come, and the, and, and the churches will begin to fall. God can do it just like it was in Egypt. Everything in Egypt gets destroyed, and everything in Goshen survives. For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. This is why he has to go do these things. This is why Moses was called for this. Because of all the pagan gods of Rome. I mean, going to the Vatican and seeing these things, I saw firsthand for myself all their pagan gods that they have in there. And the God, and they have they have inside St. Peter's Basilica a statue. They called it this, this statue Peter. And I actually have on videotape there where people are coming by and they're rubbing the feet, and the feet are practically, the toes are worn off. Because the Catholic Church says if you rub the feet of, the, uh, of St. Peter there, you get an extra blessing. Nonsense. Do you know that the statue, though, is not St. Peter? It's actually the, the statue that was taken from another part of Rome that was a statue of Jupiter. Worshipping another false god. And the Catholic people have no idea. They have no idea they're rubbing the feet of a, of a god from another temple. Mm. Anyway, so God says they shall worship, the, the, uh, for thou shalt, shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Separate yourself from them. I want to take you now to Matthew chapter 26, verse 59. And we'll close with this here. And by the way, Psalm 83, where they take counsel against thy hidden ones, that's your two witnesses. God's not revealed who they are. And all the people that think they're Moses or Elijah or something like that now, it's not scriptural. When God anoints who he's going to send. They're not going to know it until the day that they're anointed for that purpose. Their ministry is exactly three and a half years. And I've met many people that claim to be Moses and Elijah. And it's just, it doesn't, and, and I've had those that are telling me that they're already doing plagues, they're already turning the water to blood. That's not scriptural. It's got to line up with the Word of God. 
And God says exactly how long their ministry is. It's three and a half years. It's not started yet. And they'll be together when it does. And, if, and I'm sure that whoever God is intending to anoint is no doubt alive and on the earth today. I, I believe that. But they don't, they wouldn't even know who they are. You know, so all this speculation that, that, that men are doing, assuming that they're one of the two witnesses, you know, my brothers is that you suffer through with that, push that away from you. If God, whoever God calls, it'll just come out of nowhere and God will do it and it'll be done and that's the way it'll be. And it won't be a game there either. There will be no games going on in Israel. It'll be very serious. Now we have the antitype as I brought out in the video the other day. I'm only bringing this out again because I need it all in one place for you guys. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. But found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. And at the last came two false witnesses. Now notice what they wanted the false witnesses to do. They want to put Jesus to death. They want to put, and, and who is Jesus? Who is Yeshua? Yeshua is the word of Almighty God. They're wanting to kill the word. Destroy the word. And there for the first time in all the Catholic Church's history, they have two popes living in Vatican City. That's right out of their own tour, the tourist guide's mouth. He said both of them are popes. Both of them live in Vatican City. Neither one will take the royal house. They both take the lesser place. Two false witnesses. Interesting, isn't it? And what is their purpose to do? To put the word to death. To put Jesus to death. And that's exactly what they're doing. They kill. They, they, they have you distracted with their Jesuit ways and having you believe all kinds of nonsense that the Antichrist is Obama or something like that. I have no time for the nonsense. I have no time. I mean, you have to understand, the people that teach these things, many of them, not all of them as of yet, but many of them have already joined up with the Catholic Church. John Hagee, he joined right back in with Rome. That's awfully dangerous. I mean, you're on the borderline. When you join with Rome, when your church, if you go into a denominational church and they've joined in with Rome, I would get out of it. That's one good way to take the mark of the beast. I guarantee you it is. Rome is going to fix it to where you can't buy or sell saving you take the mark. And that time is rapidly approaching. Come out of her, my people. In 2 Timothy, as I said in the video the other day, you'll never think the same way about Timothy again either. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. That's last days, right? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. Well, that could be pretty much most of the world's population. But Timothy is actually going to show you something deeper than that. Without natural affection, truce breakers, and false accusers. Isn't there going to be a covenant with Israel, and isn't that covenant going to be broken? Does not Israel get falsely accused and blamed for everything? Hmm. Just something to think about. Incontinent, fierce. They love to be starting wars all over the world. Despise of those that are good. They don't like nothing about genuine Christians. You brothers and sisters that really love the Lord, stand with Israel as well. You really pray you've got a good, solid faith. You, you, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. They hate you. They're traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. Boy, they're very religious, all right, at the Vatican. They got a very good form of godliness. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. God says turn away from them. For this sort are they which creep into houses. Rome has taken the Jesuits and infiltrated every house, every Christian denomination there is. And lead captive silly women laden with sins. 
silly women. These church leaders. See, the, God always refers to the church as a woman. And why a woman? Doesn't, not, don't belittle women because of this. There's a many a good godly spiritual women. He refers to them as women because why? Both men and women. Get this now, brothers. Both men and women are referred to by God as a woman in His sight because we're supposed to be married to Christ or at least engaged to Him. But when you court the devil, you're not engaged to Christ. When you're a silly woman, a silly church, all kinds of games, everything but God involved, they led captive silly women, laden with sins, just loaded down with all kinds of sins because why? They've gotten away from the Word of God. Led away with divers' lust. Got a lot of that too. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're always studying. Got schools and seminaries all over the world. They just can't come to the knowledge of the truth. The simplicity of the gospel is just not there. This is how you know, though, what he's speaking about. Because he's, then he gives you a type. He says, Now as Janes and Jambers withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. These? He names only two? First, it sounds like a whole group. And it could be a compound meaning there. I do believe it has a compound reference in there. These also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds. He's not putting women in there. Pope Francis, Pope Benedict, Janes and Jambers, men with corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, carnal-minded, they're more into the Egyptian gods of Egypt than they are the Word of God. But then he says here, But there they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was, as James and Jambers was as well. God bless you, my brother and sister, for listening. If you bore to the end of this, there's a lot of risks that we, we're taking here as the times are drawing near to try to make sure you see these hidden things of God. We cannot do it without your help, and we really do need your help financially, prayerfully, and not necessarily in that order, but we need your help to do it. It's not a joy ride for us. Every time I go somewhere, my wife is very nervous because she knows the threats that I've had. She knows there's a lot of things we don't even share with you guys that go on. But I feel in my heart, we must do these things in order to be able to get this information to you. Just like in, for example, all these photographs I took of Pope Francis while I was there. According to, to legalities, you should be allowed to use certain things for the purpose of education, which our videos are for the educational purposes. But you need your own images if you want to be better protected. I speak a lot about Rome. I use a lot of photographs when I'm trying to illustrate things for you guys. And taking these pictures of Pope Francis it gives me my own collection. Because he is a public figure and he knows people photograph him all the time. These are the reasons, one of the, one of the reasons why we do what we do. Pray for us, so we really need your prayers. And remember us in your day. I'm Stephen Benet with the New Institute of Biblical Research. Shalom.